The presenting sponsor for On Education is Schoology. Every day, millions of students, parents, faculty, and administrators from more than 1,600 school districts leverage Schoology to advance what is possible in education. The team at Schoology is passionate about making its users successful, and they know sometimes you might need a little help to achieve your desired outcomes. To help districts find their way to success, Schoology has created Schoology Compass, a set of self-service resources and tools to support school and district leaders in their journey to success. Compass is made up of five district success routes. Each one is designed to advance what is possible at your district. To learn more about Schoology Compass, simply visit Schoology.com. Uh, well, no, especially considering I honestly think that a ladder is how I'm going to die. Welcome to On Education. I'm Mike Washburn. And I'm Glenn Irvin. Friends, we have an awesome pod for you today. We're going to discuss Google's acquisition of Workbench, why crowdfunding is making up the shortfall on school budgets, the reasons why the first year of teaching is so difficult, our top 10 formative assessment apps, and our guest this week is Monica Burns. Awesome is right. Yeah. It's a lot of stuff. Yeah, it's great. Cool. Hey, my Christmas tree went up today. Is yours up? I, I just was working on that yesterday. The whole day yesterday was about Christmas trees, lights, and everything else related to the holidays being put up in the house. We have to put the lights up outside a little bit earlier because uh, it snows uh, quite a bit earlier here. Oh, yeah. In, in Barry in particular, there's already like there's already a foot and a half of snow in my front yard. Jeez. So. Oh, yeah. No, dude, in, in Barrie, where I live, we get what's called lake effect snow. Yeah, that makes um, sense. Quite a bit. And, uh, you know, it, it basically starts snowing um, right around the second week of November and the snow doesn't go away until March. Man. So um, so we have to put the lights up pretty quick. Yes. So that the, on like the house lights. So because, you know, it's crazy to put them up when it's like slippery and yeah, snowy. And, that'd be a bit you know, dangerous. Huh? <laughs> I, uh, well, no, especially considering I honestly think that ladder, a ladder is how I'm going to die. Um, <laughs> That's your worst. I really do. You've I told me that God, before. Yeah. <laughs> have I really? Yeah, you've told. Well, you said you hate ladders. You hate. I uh, hate yes, ladders. The heights and stuff. Yes. It's it's just it's it's I'm absolutely convinced that that's how I'm going to go. So, yeah. Um, so, and actually, I was away when they did it. I was somewhere on a trip or something um, a couple weeks ago when they um, Cheryl did it with, uh, I, I believe, probably my in-laws helped out and uh, they put the lights up because, yeah, I mean, my yard is just covered in snow now, so. But the tree went up today. Very nice. It's fun. It's funny because um, we have a, a little one, right? Like he's two and a half. Yeah. Um, so he wanted to help. And so what happens is the front bottom of the tree is it's loaded, <laughs> loaded with ornaments. I'm going to take a picture of it. Actually, maybe we'll use it for like the podcast, like the picture we put out Let's when we it. tweet. Uh, yeah. Because the front. Yeah. The front of the tree is loaded with ornaments and then it's like evenly distributed everywhere else. But you can tell where Jacob just went to town. Yes. That's super cool. I like on that. the tree. We're, we're going to leave it. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. It's I like, cute. I like when the, the, our kids get involved in that and then they, they add to the decorations themselves too. So that's good. Totally. Totally. So, uh, so weigh in on this, uh, Christmas tree going up. What, what's your date? Like when, when do you do it? Do you, do you have a specific day? What time is too early? That kind of stuff. What's, uh, we, what say you, we don't have a specific day. I would say those people that do it before Thanksgiving, the United States yeah. Thanksgiving, that yeah. seems a little bit early to me, but yeah, that's, that's just me. Uh, December, anytime in December, I would say is, is a great time. Sure. Yeah. So I'm like adamant that anytime after December 1st is fine. It can, you can literally put it up December 1st. I'm cool with that. Uh, but I mean, anytime before that just seems nuts seems, to me. Yeah. Seems wild. And I know there's <laughs> always, just there's always excited. like, covers. yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, I'm not, but, but I, I get. I get people who are. My mom is one of those people that starts counting down to Christmas in like September oh. or whatever. Hi, mom. So <laughs> um, 
I, I know, I know that some people are excited. Uh, generally, I've seen, I see conversations every once in a while about making sure not to put it up until after Veterans Day or whatever. Uh, Remembrance Day, out of respect. Um, I mean, I, I don't know if it's a sign of disrespect that you put your Christmas tree up uh, before nah, Veterans Day. I don't know but, how they're related. Yes, exactly. But, right, but I right. get I you. Just, I get you. Yes, <laughs> but I do. You see it all over the internet, so I mean, it must be something that someone thinks. Yeah. Um, but yeah, December 1st is fine. So what's today? Today's December 2nd, recording on December 2nd. We're doing great. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect timing. Tree looks great. Lots of ornaments, front center, uh, just, I suppose, where they belong. And we're good to go. All the other random stuff is out uh, that just ends up in my way when I'm trying to, like, make my breakfast or something. Like that. <laughs> <sighs> Anyways, Google acquires, let's, let's move on yeah. to, you know, other stuff. Now Google acquires workbench. I had actually never heard of workbench, but now that I'm looking at it, it should have been something I'd heard about S- similar to my, my thoughts on things like Pear Deck that I didn't even know existed until September. Um, tell us about what, what is workbench and why do you think this is important? Um, well, they said, I mean, within the article that we'll go ahead and share that, uh, Workbench and Google Classroom were already basically integrated together. So it's not a right. big surprise that they acquired them. But yeah. it is an interesting take on kind of like a, I was describing it to you off air, a combination of code.org and kind of a project based learning lesson plan unit uh, planning uh, type of, of uh, website. And so there's these there's these activities that you have your students do. Uh, they seem really in a wide variety of content areas and for a wide variety of grades. And they seem really, really in-depth. You know, sometimes these sites kind of provide these lesson plans that are just so generic. Uh, Pearson would be a good example of that. Mm-hmm. Um, but <laughs> I got to take my shot at them. Uh, but this is super detailed, very well done. Uh, stand, they, they list their standards. And then there's a component of coding that's associated with it, uh, with each one of the different activities. So it's a, a really interesting take on project-based learning and slash working with coding. Um, so yeah, yeah. Oh, I mean, I was. it says it's not a big surprise that Google ended up acquiring them. They didn't say for how much. It didn't I mean, say that. That's fine. I'd be interested in knowing that number, but uh, uh, raised three million dollars in funding. So, and, and I mean, when I you look at their their uh, their partner list down at the bottom, I mean, Makey Makey, Sphero, Little Bits, Microbit, big, those are all big time companies, pretty big names. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Parrot is what? That's the drone company, right? Yes, I think I believe so. Like, so I mean. Big partners. None of the people that I uh, I work with are on there, unfortunately. But uh, maybe that's I, I have the power to change things now. Hey, interesting. Never enough, know. So you'll check into it and see what you get. I'm I'm, I'm looking at this now because uh, I think it's uh, super interesting. Uh, it looks like a neat platform, and it's free for, too for uh, teachers that want to go look into it. That workbench platform is for you. Sign up with a Google account. Boom, you have access to all the lessons. So it's very interesting. Awesome. Big deal. I'm sure if if $3 million is all they ever raised, I, I can guarantee you the people who are uh, getting out uh, based on that are, are probably making a decent amount of coin if Google is buying them. Because there's no doubt it, it's selling for quite a bit more than that, I'm sure. Yes. Um, this one's interesting, this topic of crowdfunding, uh, especially to make up, you know, shortfalls. Or, or things that teachers need or, or whatever. Um, obviously, we're going to see a lot more uh, of this sort of thing in the future. And we're kind of partnered up or, or we've worked with uh, Pledge Sense before. Yes. Uh, the with the teachers, teachers are professionals, professionals. In, yep. in, in a couple different ways. Um, not only having Andy and, um, and Alice uh, Keeler on, on the pod, um, but through my work with uh, Steve Isaacs on the uh, class craft assignment. Exactly. So we've been involved with Pledge Sense a couple of different ways. Um, but what did you think of this article? Well, I just, I, I mean, it's amazing that people are such hustlers, which it doesn't surprise me, actually, that, that educators are such hustlers. That's what I mean by people. Uh, mm. But it's sad in a way that 
that energy to hustle to be able to go ahead and 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 get your projects crowdfunded. The energy is not being directed at kind of some creative things, you know, within your classrooms. You know what I mean? Or more energy towards things that you can uh, have direct results with your students. Instead, it's like bringing in having to bring in more money because our school budgets are so limited. So right. it's it's a it's a great positive, but it's also a negative because our our school budgets are limited so much. In fact, that you have to crowdfund in order to make up the shortfalls. It's amazing. The article talks a little bit about inequality and how like one school uh, on one side of a, a city, you know, has a budget of like twenty five thousand dollars. And, and you know a school on the other side of the city has a budget of two thousand dollars yes and sick. you know so crowdfunding is is a way for these some of these teachers to um make up the inequality at least a little bit but i mean if a school is in an area and the teacher only has a budget of two thousand dollars then i i feel like it's logical to do to deduce that you know, the crowdfunding potential is a little bit less as well. Yes. Potentially, you know, if you're in a, a low wealth neighborhood, then you're going to have a hard time raising funds um, when people are having a hard time just putting food on their own tables. Yes. Um, so I, so I guess social media then would, which has such right. a huge impact then, you know, to make sure that you can put your things out there and say, Hey, here's what we're doing. Here's my plan. I'm organized. I have a mission help yeah. us out, you know, with a few dollars here. And and a lot of teachers are doing that. They're hustling and they're working hard at making sure that these things get funded. Yeah. So, I mean, using, this is where things like having a PLN, having a, a, a network of people that you know on Twitter that you can get help from on Twitter, or whatever, to, to reach out and, and let people know that you're trying to raise money for something. Um, you know, that makes a huge difference, huge difference. Big time. So, um, you know, and, and so uh, we are going to see tons more of this for sure. It, it seems to be working for some people. It's probably related to how much effort you put into it. But and how cool your project is. I'll tell you, um, you know, if you have a cool project and, and you um, can can even with us talk to us about the outcomes and what you're looking to do. For sure. There's a good chance that I'd be even interested in supporting it. And we actually did that just this week, didn't we? Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, we would be more than happy to go ahead and advertise for you and retweet things that you guys are, are working on, or we'll put them on the podcast and, and, and maybe you'll be able to reach that specific goal, whatever you're going for. 100%. This, uh, I, I kind of just came across this one uh, teacher who was crowdfunding for a, a, a small little language project. She only needed a couple hundred bucks. Um, uh, so, so we, as the podcast, we pitched in 25 um, and, and uh, we'd love to see the results of that. Uh, but there's tons of these little projects and um, the guys at uh, Classcraft, we talked about that. If you listen to our episode, um, uh, with uh, with those folks, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about the exact same thing about wanting to to actually have a, a meaningful, real impact on what's actually happening in an actual classroom. It does it, it does um, make a difference, uh, and it's real money going to a real thing, and that's that's really special. Uh, so yeah, if you if you have a really cool idea. Um, Please let us know about it. Just tweet at us and um, share it with us so that we can share it out. And we'd be happy to to use our social networking. I mean, it's not huge. We don't have whatever 150,000 followers like Miss Keeler or anything like that. But not yet. <laughs> not yet. We're working on it. <laughs> right. Um, but, you know, we'll help if we can. And, you know, we may even pitch in some money you, you guys keep listen if you guys keep downloading and sharing we keep getting sponsors that that gives us money and that doesn't just go towards you know buying uh buying video games uh even though it might no uh it uh it helps us do this stuff yes the good know? work i i wouldn't be able to put in 25 dollars towards that 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 job that that um project if we didn't have it because yes. of our sponsors. So we wanted to make a difference and hopefully that does. Um, 
this is a really interesting topic. This last one that yes. we're going to talk about, actually, second last one, I guess we got. This is a fun, jam packed episode of on education, There's folks. Tons of stuff you're, we're talking. You're about. getting value for your time, your commuting time today. <laughs> um, this is an article about why uh, teachers leave um, the profession. I guess. And I guess my first thought on this, and you can talk a lot more to this than I can. So I'm going to let you talk. I just want to say that I, I feel like this is something that happens a lot more in the U S than it does in Canada. In fact, I don't really know other than occasional teachers. These are like supply list teachers. Uh, you know what I'm talking about? Like, yeah. right. Yeah. Like, a okay. So long-term sub kind of that type of thing. Right. Yes. Other than people who are like wallowing on supply lists. Cause they haven't gotten, remember I've explained this a couple of times. Our process to get like a full-time contract is extensive and ridiculous and pretty stupid. Um, so other than people who end up sitting on like a supply list for five or six years and just are like, damn, I got to get on with my life. I got to go do something else. Yes. Other than that, like once you're in a full-time contract as a teacher in Canada, generally speaking, people don't leave. So, so I think that this is, and I, I think that this has a lot to do with salary. And when we're looking at these, you posted some charts in our notes and I think I'm generally right. Am I not? Yeah. I mean, the, the biggest thing is the statistics that we have in front of us is basically why would teachers leave their job you know right uh, the number one thing is salary uh right after that it actually is really interesting i mean we have things like school climate and then of course like leadership super important uh as far as why people would leave their jobs now why would people remain in their positions very similar again too we have salary and school climate and i thought it was interesting too mike that a level of autonomy is important on both mm. whether or not you remain or you're going to leave if you don't feel, if you don't feel like you're able to go ahead and do some things you know uh, creatively as a teacher that everything is kind of like i i, I want to just say like you're just having to do the exact same thing as everybody else ah, it's a tough it's a tough uh, gig i think so that would be another reason why you might uh, end up leaving but salary super important leadership trust yes level of, of autonomy huge things greater subject reassignment um, was one that was a little yeah. bit higher up on the Yeah, if, if, if you ended up like, if you were teaching something, and it happens a lot in the United States where you were teaching a content area and then you're on the bottom of the totem pole as far as uh, tenure, you might mm -hmm. be asked to teach outside of your content area. You know what I mean? Uh, and right. so that would be enough to put, you know, that looks like that's one of the things of why you might not want to stay you know, as far as in the profession. The, the, that one specifically happens a decent amount in um, Canada, where it, it, it in particular, it, it actually happens to women quite a bit who go on maternity leave. Oh, no. Because under the, under the collective bargaining contract, as far as I know, the school, the board has to give you your teaching job back. Obviously, you can't, can't lose your job because you got, pregnant you had a child and went on maternity leave yeah. but they are not obligated to put you in the same grade as you taught before oh, no uh so and and i've actually seen this um at at where i was teaching where you know women would come back from maternity leave and be teaching a completely different subject it now that being said it would not necessarily be enough for them to leave and that's because uh, as we notice in these charts that some of the also the reasons why people stay yes um in, in teaching is because of salary well i mean this is definitely the reason why canadian teachers don't leave uh teaching is one of the best jobs you can have in canada that's awesome as far as you know the combination of salary and job security is concerned yeah. Um, and, you know, un you know, for better or for worse, you'll put up with a lot of crap if, you know, you're able to live a comfortable life outside of your job. You may not be the most effective teacher in the world and you may not, you know, enjoy it as much as you should if you're putting up with a lot of nonsense. Sure. But the salary will keep you there. 
It could. And it could. Yeah. I mean, I think though. I mean, of course, I would think like number one would be just job satisfaction. You know, if you're you have a passion for it, you're doing what you love, and then you actually get good pay, like you were just describing. Then you're going to put up with a lot of the other types of things because you're like, well, it doesn't matter what type of job. There's going to be that nonsense. You know what I mean? Every it's job nonsense. has its nonsense. Exactly. Right. Right. For sure. So. I mean, teaching is hard, man. Yeah, it is. That's our good transition, though, too. Teaching is hard. <laughs> right. Uh, and, I mean, that's why people leave. And and so we saw this this tweet. I saw it, too. And, and you put it in the notes. And I'm glad you did, because I'll tell you, I have nightmares about my first year of teaching. Um, this this um, Jonathan Pullum. Yep tweeted and it got it got around it, it, and he wrote I, I guess i'll quote it yeah said moment of moment of vulnerability teaching is hard being a first year teacher is hard asking for and receiving help is really difficult for me teacher exhaustion is real yes and it's been hitting and it's it is real and it's been hitting pretty hard lately is what he said basically yeah and i uh, i couldn't agree more my first year of teaching was brutal <laughs> brutal i remember it. it it wasn't so far away to be honest so i remember it pretty clearly and i i, I was at the school at probably 6 30 or 7 in the morning and leaving at 6 or 6 30 at night and um uh i was getting into a lot of uh arguments <laughs> with <laughs> my my boss because i wasn't afraid to tell him that he was wrong and um and and that we needed to do things in a certain way and um you know i was trying to do the job as best as i could while you know learning and taking it all in and um you know working at a private school has its own sorts of challenges that are a little bit different sure um so I remember it and it was a grind, man. So I get this. I get this completely. Yeah. No, I gotcha. How was how was your first year of teaching? Do you yep. do you remember you've been teaching for a lot longer than I have? How how was it? it how was, do you, do you uh, remember it? Yep, ninety eight, ninety nine uh was okay. my first year of teaching, so twenty years ago basically. Uh, and I taught in a little town uh fourteen miles from the Mexican border. It's called Holtville, and it's in southern southeastern California. I want to shout out to the, it's called the Imperial Valley, and it's a big desert down in southeastern California. Um, nice. And I went uh, specifically to this town because my wife was already teaching there. Um, and so I ended up taking whatever was given to me. You know how that is, Mike? You know, whatever, whatever job was open. So, sure. so I actually taught, you know, I'm a Spanish teacher by trade. But I taught yeah. uh, English language learners in uh, world history. I taught geography. <laughs> That's fine. I, I taught uh, introduction to keyboarding and computers. <laughs> yeah, you did. Isn't that weird? Like, and then my last thing I taught in this, like, it was kind of a rotating uh, freshman class, uh, and I taught geography. So it's just really strange things. But I, I, w I don't remember being sad or frustrated about that. I was just happy I had a job. You know, kind of one of those things where you're like, cool, I'm right. teaching. And then I was also coaching every season. So in the fall, I was coaching cross country and I coached basketball in the winter. And then in the spring, I was a head track coach. So it was busy, busy, you busy. You enjoyed your first year. Yeah, no, it was. It, and it was just uh, a I blur, didn't. you know, a, kind of a blur, you know. Uh, yeah. But one of the things that I do remember, especially about this first year, is that kids could see the passion in you. And that's what really got me going as far as like, I knew that teaching was where I needed to be. They could see your passion and then they kind of followed along. You know what I mean? Even though you might not even have taught that specific content area, but they could see your passion for teaching. And then they were able to go ahead and rise up also. And then be, they were super appreciative of, of you going and being willing to go ahead and teach and being there and all these types of things. So uh, really, really uh, positive experience for me, but super difficult. I also responded to Jonathan and told him, Hey, everybody's first years. Yeah. It's not just yeah. year, but first years are difficult because there's so yeah. much to learn. And there's a lot of frustrations that you didn't take into consideration that 
are at, that are real as far as in the teaching profession. And the majority of them have nothing to do with students or teaching. It's the right hard work though, right? Yes. We, I know we reference it all the time in a lot of different ways, but now we're talking about us and adults and, and we need to, it's not just about finding the right hard work for our kids. It's, you know, as a person finding the right hard work for you. Yes. I actually wrote a whole paper about why I left my job to teach and how I relate that to games based learning and uh, video games and education. And I compared my, you know, my guild leading in World of Warcraft to being the right hard work to make up for the fact that I hated my job yes. in, when I was in sales. And, and that's why I left. I identified that I wasn't doing what I love to do um, and that education was what I was meant to do. Um, so, you know, Jonathan, buddy, hang in there. We'll, uh, we'll give you another shout out when we release the podcast. So you Absolutely. Can listen to us talk about you. Um, but we're, we're, um, it's hard for everybody, man. It's hard for everybody. It's supposed to be hard. If it wasn't hard, it wouldn't be worth it. Yes. Because everything in life that's hard is the things that, you know, that you find you get the most value out of. Absolutely. And, um, you know, if it wasn't hard, it wouldn't be worth it. So stick in there. It's a grind. Uh, who would say that Randall Sampson would tell you it's a grind. It's a grind. He has the, the uh, little bracelets. Right. Yes. So grind on buddy. You'll, uh, you'll get there. Uh, it's supposed to be hard. Uh, and that's how, you know, you're doing a good job because you care. So keep it up. Uh, you, you posted a screenshot of Andy. Yes. (laughs) Yes. A great picture of Andy, uh, Lizer. Yes. Andy Lizer. uh, Asking about, uh, real time student response. Yeah, web-based resources for real time. My first thought was Pear Deck. Is that what I'm thinking? Is that what he's thinking? It could be Pear Deck. It, think yeah. BYOD. Think from BYOD student device to projected image on the board manipulation. A board a bonus. I, I Nearpod Pear Deck. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And then people then just started including all of the things that we're going to transition to as far as formative assessment type of apps. So they were just basically now throwing out all of these different tools, which I thought was awesome. Cool. You know, not just sticking with what he was talking about, but you know, we, like you just said, Paradeck, Nearpod, uh, fantastic tools. If you don't use them already, you should check them out. Uh, even the free versions are amazing. Um, and yeah, no, I really liked that everybody got involved in this and really started saying, Hey, here's some different tools that we're using right now and that there's that we're successful with in our specific classrooms. Cool. So when we come back, we're going to actually take a deep dive into this a little bit. We're going to talk about some of our favorite formative assessment apps. uh, And hopefully there's something that you've never tried before that you'll love. So uh, stay tuned. On Education is brought to you by Classcraft. Classcraft is an amazing teaching resource created by teachers. Classcraft is dedicated to making school relevant and engaging to all of our students. Classcraft is proud to announce their Questathon quests created with shared storylines and custom illustrations to bring any subject to life. Every time a teacher downloads one of the free quests, Classcraft will add $1 to the Teachers Are Professionals fund, which will be used to fund teacher requests to PledgeSense.com. To learn more about Classcraft, simply go to Classcraft.com. All right, welcome back to the podcast. We are going to have a quick chat about uh, formative assessment apps. There's there's so many, Glenn. There are so many apps. Tons. Tons and tons of apps. Um, Programs. Yeah, and that's web-based. That's got to be overwhelming for some teachers, though, too, that aren't in in our space. You know, we get excited. I think, you know, we're kind of uh, that type of personality where we get excited about new tools, you know, and learning about new things and and it's okay that there's hundreds of them, but it can be overwhelming for just just a regular everyday teacher to keep track of like what is the difference between this and this, and what is actually good for me to use in these specific situations. I, this would be overwhelming for the new teacher who, you know, is looking at a giant list of things and not necessarily having the experience to know which ones are the right ones. Like when there's five or six different quizzing apps I know. for example yes and there's like four or five different um presentation mm-hmm. you know interactive presentation apps and there's 
you know, audio apps and there's video apps and it's crazy. There, there's tons of them. Um, you know, so I, I haven't made like a top 10 list. I don't know if that's what we were going to try to do. Sure. Uh, well, or, we're just going to throw out some things and then maybe, we, maybe we you develop have a, a top 10, you know, kind of thing. You know, we should, yeah. we should, we could make a blog post actually Glenn. Yeah. <laughs> that's what we should do. Make the blog post top 10. We should make, we should make a blog post. People love top 10 lists. Let's do it. And then it'll be controversial because we'll we'll exclude somebody and then they'll be like really mad at us. <laughs> oh, then we'll get into fights on the internet, which is like my favorite thing. Yeah. I figured you'd be up for that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Cool. So you got a list here. Go go through your you you wrote these down. So yeah, these I'm are assuming that these are some of the ones like- that I was just taking uh a note of when we were looking at Andy Lizer's Twitter post and just a bunch of people responding. So if mm-hmm. I was going to go with top 10 formative assessment apps, like when a teacher comes in and they're like, I want to, you know, what kind of app should I be using? Depending upon the situation, because some of these are situational, you know, they're different than each other in a way. They're still formative assessment, but they're, you know, some of them are uh, games, you know, and some of them are more, okay. like you just said, a presentation tool. Um, so I I would start, uh, I mean, on my list here, I'm just going to skip around here, but I would start probably with Nearpod, um, and Nearpod and Pear Deck seem to do similar things, but in different ways. Right. So I'm a big proponent of Nearpod just because there's still a lot of direct instruction that happens in classrooms today. So Mm that's, that's a thought of, uh, you know, having a student-centered classroom where it's really a lot of it is driven from the student side, I think is we're still a ways away from that happening, you know, uh, for the majority of classrooms. So there's still a lot of direct instruction. So the best direct instruction tool to go ahead and use, I believe, is Nearpod as far as getting students engaged and making sure that you know where they're at as far as in their knowledge, because you can do it not just with multiple choice and open-ended questions, but also with drawing tools and some of those types of things. So really have a wide variety of things to do there. So which one would you go with Mike? So I like this whole ecosystem of quizzing apps, like uh, what Gim, well, Gim kit is on our list here. Yes. I like it because it uses this, like this currency system that they have, right? For sure. Yeah. Money. Aren't, aren't they the ones yeah. that have the money yeah, or whatever? Love it. Which is kind of neat. I think that's cool. Um, I love quizzing apps. I, I think anything that it in, in has like a, a gamification type element to it uh, is a blast. The kids love, um, you know, the students that I had were pretty competitive as well. So they enjoyed anything where they were, they felt like they were almost like in a, in a bit of a competitive environment. Yes. Um, so, so if that's a, not every, not every classroom is like that. Not every classroom is the same, obviously. Um, some classes, some students don't, you know, get going, um, by seeing their name, you know, in a leaderboard and stuff like that. But, um, my students certainly did. So yeah, I like anything that anything like that is, is pretty fun. I would agree with you. And I would, I always tell people if you're going to use those as review apps, you know, uh, any kind of gaming apps, then use a, a variety of them, mix them up. So don't always use Kahoot, for example, or Quizlet live. or right, Quizzes. Right. There's a bunch of them. There's enough of them that you can vary them that yeah. they're always novel, you know? So it doesn't feel like, Oh, in every class you're doing a Kahoot, for example. Uh, Cause I've heard that actually from students that they're like, Oh, it just gets old after a while. You're just doing it in every class. It, and it's, it's lost its luster, you know, it's, it, it, and, and so, and you want to make sure, of course, like you just said that not all of your students are competitive. So you want to make sure you have a variety of different tools that you're going to use for them. But yeah, we have all kinds of tools here that uh, we have poll everywhere. Uh, have you ever used this thing called clickers? So there's about four or five of them on here that I've never used. Plickers. Plickers is an interesting uh, I've never one. used. Pull everywhere I've never used. Menta, Mentimeter. Yeah, Mentimeter. Yep. I've never used that. Okay. Uh, what is Jamboard? And Jamboard they was one of the ones that uh, several people were talking about, and they needed a specific tool to be able to then use it, you know? So we should investigate that one further. 
uh, if you guys know something about Jamboard, tell us and if it's being effective in your class. Because I had never heard of that. So I wanted to make sure I added it to our list here and say, awesome. hey, how do you guys use this right now? Oh, it's like a Google thing. Is it? Very cool. It's a device. Yeah, that's what I thought. We had. That's what someone said. Do you need to purchase the device in order for us to be able to do this? And and uh, so then I was like, oh, okay. But the Plickers one, I don't know if, it, if you have – uh, and if the teacher has an iPad, for example, but the students don't have one-to-one devices or the, stu- or the teacher has a phone, even the reason why Plickers is so, uh, was, is really well received is the students don't need the one-to-one device. It's pretty interesting, huh? So up on the board, the teacher puts up some questions or whatever it might be. And the students raise up kind of what ends up being similar to a QR code for the response mic. <gasps> Have you seen this? Before? I've seen this, and then it gathers all the this. data with the phone, with the with the uh, camera app, you know. Yeah, and then it knows yep. like kind of where the students, uh, you know, where are they at with this. So it gathers the data very quickly and says, "Hey, the majority of you chose A, for example, but really the answer is C, and here's why." You know, we can go ahead and have a discussion. So it's a real way of kind of going uh, around not having a one to one device. So plickers. Yes. I've never used this, but I've I've never used this as the teacher, but I've participated in it being used. Yes. Um and and uh it's it's pretty brilliant, yes, it let is. me tell you. And the 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 speed in which it picks up the data is what I found was impressive. Like it scans you you move your iPad around and it's looking for a specific image. Yes. And depending on your answer, you'll have a different image on a piece of paper yep. that you just hold up in the exactly. air. And, and you know, the one iPad that the person, the, the person who's running it, it waves it kind of around and it picks up whatever image and then it sorts them based on the image that you were holding up. And um, it's, it's quite astounding how quickly it picked up, picks up the, the results. Um, but it's cool because you can like, you could use this constantly um, with the same cards and just give maybe even at the start of the year, give each uh, student, a, a, you know, a, a set of four yeah. cards laminated that could cards. be laminated, yeah, right? Exactly. Put a little, put a little um, binder loop or whatever in them to like hold, keep them all together. They keep them in their desks and then, and then you set up the questions whenever you want for whatever you want. And then boom. And then you just say, okay, we're going to, let's see where everyone's at. We're going to do this. And you get instant information. The kids could, you wouldn't have to like hand these, these sets of tags out. You can just um, keep them in your desk. Students keep them in their desk. If they can keep them kind of organized, like I said, in like a, maybe a binder, you know, I'm talking about like a binder. Yes. Gotcha. Hole, hole punch each one of them, put them all together. Keep them out. Answer some questions. Yep. Love it. It'd be awesome. Yeah, it, like, I mean, it, that would be like super quick. You won't need devices exactly. necessarily. Um, and, and you can still get that fun. Like it's fun. I, I thought it was really neat when I was doing it. Like I thought it was um, pretty entertaining to, to, to do. And um, you're still like giving the instructor a good amount of uh, information. Um, so right. I, I like that one. Jamboard is a lot like um, uh, Microsoft has a competing product, a Surface, a big Surface screen, okay. basically. So they're selling it to schools, I guess, but probably mostly also to businesses um, as like a collaborative whiteboard, basically, oh, cool. um, you know, for, for more businesses. It's like super, you know, nice looking and high tech and and whatnot so so that's what a jam board is obviously uh flipgrid came up on this list uh i had never seen yeah of course yeah. so i mean i don't know how much more we need to say about no. flipgrid at this point um slack on this list was interesting i've never seen slack used as a i thought it was interesting kind of too uh, school tool yeah i would but... want to know more about how schools are using it because i would say isn't slack more of a collaborative uh, organizational tool do you know what i mean like a project right, organization yeah. uh discussions email replacement yep, for exactly uh, on a specific topic to make sure that you're uh, fulfilling whatever it is that you're working on uh but yeah, yeah no it's it was interesting i would want to know more about how they're using it as a formative assessment tool right right so yeah. lots of interesting apps here and uh, and some really, really 
cool stuff. We'll post the, there's a big list. We got kind of the idea from a, a, a list that showed up on uh, on the NWEA uh, website. So we'll post that um, article uh, and you can hopefully take a look at it and maybe you'll, uh, maybe you'll see something that you haven't used before, be awesome. which is fun, 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 fun. Uh, when we come back, uh, we're going to be joined uh, by the awesome uh, Monica Burns. So stay with us. On Education is brought to you by Audible. So I got to tell you about this book. So I'm reading a book called You Can't Spell America Without Me. It's written by Alec Baldwin. Um, and it's and it's in Trump's vernacular. Like it's in his voice. Like <laughs> it's written. It's like as if it was written by Donald Trump. Okay. And so I'm reading it. And I'm thinking uh, every time I'm reading it, I I'm hearing Donald Trump's voice reading it to me. So I looked up on Audible okay. if it was there, and I'm telling you it's there. Oh so my goodness! So this is Alec Baldwin in the voice of Donald Trump reading the book "You Can't Spell America Without Me." You've got to listen to this. It is an absolute nightmare of a book. It's hysterical. So all that you guys have to do to listen to You Can't Spell America Without Me is go to audibletrial.com slash oneducation. That's audibletrial.com slash oneducation. And you will get a free audiobook download, which you should totally use for You Can't Spell America Without Me by Alec Baldwin. Read to you by Alec Baldwin (laughs) in the voice of Donald Trump. There's nothing better. So go do that like right now. All right, welcome back to the podcast, everyone. We are uh, thrilled to be joined uh, today by Monica Burns, who's going to be speaking at uh, FETC uh, this coming winter. And also, we just found out or just realized she's going to be at Ties as well. Welcome to the podcast, Monica. Thank you for having me. So excited to be here. So before we get going, uh, maybe you can give us a little bit of the Monica Burns 101. Who are you? What do you do? Where are you from and your background? Give us a sense of how you got to, uh, to where you are now and what you're, what you're doing. So I am a former New York City public school teacher. So I taught in a classroom where we started off with overhead projectors. But by the time that I left, uh, we had two years one-to-one iPad. And so that's really when I started speaking and sharing and blogging about the work that was happening in my classroom. And when I left the classroom, I continued doing the writing and the blogging piece, but then also traveling and working with schools in different spaces who are really looking to be more thoughtful with their technology integration, as well as writing and publishing uh, several books on education technology. So Monica, you co-wrote a book with Ben Ford. I think it just came out and it's about an ed tech tool called Adobe Spark. And the title of the book is 40 Ways to Inject Creativity into Your Classroom with Adobe Spark. So what makes Spark a go-to ed tech tool for student creation? So our book came out uh, just a few weeks ago through EdTech Team Press, and we really are excited about Adobe Spark from the creation side of things. I came across it when I was searching for open-ended creation tools in the classroom that were free, that would work on Chromebooks and iPads and whatever anyone got. And so I connected with the folks at Adobe and with Ben Forda and started sharing uh, their tool uh, more thoughtfully. And that's when we had the idea for some really concrete activities, lesson ideas, ways that teachers could use Adobe Spark in the classroom. And that's how the book came about. That's awesome. Um, So I'm really interested in this, in discussing a session you're doing at FETC and it's called school branding and storytelling again with Adobe Spark. Uh, And in the description of the session, you say, How is your school and classroom viewed by the outside world? And Mike and I talk about this type of thing all the time. So why do you think it's so important for teachers and admin to be aware of how they are viewed outside of the school? And can you give us some advice on how to best leverage, for example, the power of creation tools like Adobe Spark and social channels to celebrate teaching and learning at schools? 
So this is a topic that I'm really excited about because I spend a lot of time thinking about students as creators in the classroom, which is how I got connected and um, really dove into the Adobe Spark tools. But anyone can use them to tell a story. And that's where the school storytelling comes in. So I've had the chance to work with some school leaders, chat with school leaders and brainstorm with them different ways to share their school stories. And I really think it's so important that everyone tells the great work that's already happening in their building. So it's not about creating new moments or anything like that. It's really about saying, what is everyone already doing? How can we snap pictures, create a video, put together a quick website and do all of the things that can help other people understand all of the wonderful things happening in a school, in a district and share that locally, right? So with people who are nearby in a classroom or more globally, (laughs) if they want to share their story with the world. Absolutely. Nice. Uh, So in in the previous segment uh, of this episode, we were discussing our top, kind of our go-to formative assessment tools. Uh, And at FETC, you discussed that exact topic in a session called Make It Count, 15 formative assessment favorites for K-12 to classrooms. Can you um, share with our audience your top, what are your top three formative assessment tools Wow, that's a good question. And I'm sure you know, it's always tough, right? When you have a a listicle of favorites um, to pick just a couple. I would say one of my go-tos that I use all the time, especially when I'm demoing in classrooms. So a lot of times when I'm visiting schools, it's not just me kind of popping in for one day and then leaving, although sometimes that's mm-hmm. part of it. Um, more often um, than not, and one of my favorites, I'm you know with schools and more of a side-by-side coaching role. So one that I use a lot when I'm in classrooms is Nearpod. I've used it with pre-K students as all the way up to adult learners. And it's great because you have that embedded uh, real-time formative assessment, whether it's a quick sketch or drawing or a quick question that someone has responded to. So I would say Nearpod's definitely um, near the top of my list when it comes to formative assessment because you can get a wide range of information in lots of different ways. So there's that differentiated piece kind of built into the formative assessment data collection as well. I would also, I don't think I can, you know, do a a list, even a top three without mentioning (laughs) Google um, tools. So maybe this is a you know, wide, you wider, you can go to, you can go to <laughs> right? Um, so, you know, as much as I love something like Google Forms, right, which is great for making customizable data entry forms sure. uh, and gathering information, I really think that the real time, concrete, right, relevant, actionable uh, commenting that you can do within the Google Docs or Google Slides or even Sheets, if that's a space that you're in with yeah. your kids, you know, that is really where the magic happens when we think about leveraging the power of digital tools. So someone can get information and actually use it, right? So when we think about formative assessment data, it really should be actionable. So if we can go in, we can see something, we can leave a comment and response. Not only are we on a fact-finding mode as an educator, but then we're giving a student something that they can work with, right? So that's definitely up there too. So Nearpod and then the commenting within the Google um, ecosystem and then the forms collection, um, that might round out my top three. Cool. Yeah, we, we it's funny. We uh, we had a debate about, what was it, Glenn, maybe about five, four or five episodes ago about kind of yeah. tech tools and apps. And, and one of the things that came up when we were debating was how powerful the commenting and, you know, uh, thought system is for Google docs and stuff like that, how you can collaborate and how teachers can like just edit things on the spot or, or provide insider feedback on the spot. Uh, it it makes it a game changer when it comes to, to doing uh, work that we've been doing forever. Um, and it's a, it is quite a valuable tool, I guess. No, I absolutely sure. agree with that. And mm-hmm. it's something too, where when we talk about, you know, how many Chromebooks does your school have? How many iPads is your school? Like, like, that's great that you have access to technology, but then it's the, how are you using it? Right. So those use cases that you just shared are, are really important for us to think about, right. When talking about how powerful technology is once you have it. Hey, Monica, we don't have this on the, our questions, but I was going to ask you this. Um, is there a ed tech tool? Mike and I are always looking out for like the newest, latest, and greatest that people maybe aren't using fully right now. Because 
uh, we talk about Nearpod and Google Forms or, or sorry, Google Suite in general. But are there is there anything out there where you're like, people, you should really check this out. And this is something that would be powerful. So I have one for you guys specifically, I guess, because we're we're thinking about podcasting today, right? Um, Go or Synth, I should say. I want to say their website's Go Synth or on social, they're Go Synth. So sometimes I'm putting them together. But Synth, like a synthesizer, S-Y-N-T-H, is a tool that I've come across uh, recently. And they reached out to me. They gave me a nice demo of their tool. And so they're looking at like bite-sized or really short recordings. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that's one that I'm just really pumped about. And I think that from a formative assessment piece, being able to take more of an audio spin, like I love Flipgrid. I think it's really powerful, but it's always interesting for me to see, you know, who's comfortable with video and who's not comfortable. And I don't even mean adults, right? It's the, it's, I think at first I was surprised. I was like, don't you want to, you know, show your, like, don't you want to do a video? Aren't you excited about this? Some right. Kids just don't. But, right. Not everyone's comfortable. And I think it's really important right. to be, you know, respectful of that. When I, you know, just recently, um, or I shouldn't say too recently, but maybe in the spring, this past spring, I was working with students who were recording their voice within book reader to make some interactive books. And I thought that was going to be really exciting for them. Right. But everyone's comfort level of, Ooh, I don't know how my voice sounds or, Oh, I don't know. Right. But ghost, um, or synth is one that I think is going to be, uh, a really interesting um, one to watch in the formative assessment space. Didn't we talk about it. that? Didn't we talk about that a few months ago? Glenn? Yes, I think because it's, it was up. a former company. Um, I believe it was, I can't yep. remember who they, who they were um, before. They were recap. Recap. So, yes, exactly. Yeah. So I had been familiar with them for a while. I thought Recap was really great, but then Flipgrid was doing something that kind of fell, I think, in that space. So when they, um, you know, were, I guess, looking for their next steps, I don't know too, too much about that, you know, origin story. Um, But yeah, they're connected with those folks. That's awesome. It's funny. They actually said as much too about, they referenced Flipgrid, I think, in that email that they sent out to everybody that they were, you know, changing things up. They were doing a pivot that, you know, Flipgrid basically, you know, cut their lawn, so to speak, and and, and whatnot. But the, the, the new tool sounds really, really cool. It's amazing how many tools are out there. I actually just discovered Pear Deck like three months ago for some reason. And I love that thing. I, I love Pear Deck. And I'm working on a whole bunch of slide decks for a bunch of different stuff. And and I plan on using Pear Deck. And, and Glenn actually loves loves using Nearpod. Yes, quite my a bit. favorite it's tool. Just, <laughs> there are so many awesome tools out there, right? Eh? Yeah, it's really interesting. You know, I've been in this kind of blogging and sharing tool space, right, for a while. And so I'm mm. always interested to see like what kind of trends are there, right? When it's something like Pear Deck or Nearpod, or if it's something like that Flipgrid, like recap type of thing, like, you know, can there be a bunch of tools that do something pretty similar, right? Where do you have that saturation level um, to? And then it's always neat to see like the breakdown to say, oh, this is the one little way it's different. And that's going to be a game changer for one person when another person might not really care too much about that one little feature. Right on. Uh, so one last, I guess, very important question. Glenn and I were talking <laughs> about Christmas Christmas uh, earlier in the podcast, and uh, my Christmas tree went up today. Uh, so I guess we want to know, do you have any Christmas traditions, big plans? Do you have a tree in your home? Uh, and when does it go up or is it up already? Do you want to weigh in? Weigh in on this for us, Monica. <laughs> so my tree is up. Mine went up nice. after Thanksgiving. So I did a, okay, a trip wow. down to visit family. And when I came back, I put it up that weekend. My tree is a fake tree. <laughs> I live in Jersey City. So I'm in a city. And it is a gold tree. <laughs> a tinsel awesome. gold tree. I'm going to see a picture I, of that. Yeah, oh, yeah. I'll make sure to put one up on Instagram this week. I'm nice. still in the ornament mode where I bought new ornaments but need some hooks <laughs> For those extra ornaments, you know, those things you don't think of when you get excited at Target. So that uh, tree is up. It is a skinny, tall tree because I'm in a small square footage situation uh, right now. Uh, but yeah, it was my kind of, ooh, I think I need that a few years ago. <laughs> <laughs> nice. That is so nice. cool. So, so there you have it. Monica's weighed in. The tree is up. 
Do you do you have thoughts on how early a tree should go up? I have or, a, or late when when should yeah. when is there a too early? So a couple things here. My rule is after Thanksgiving. Absolutely. I saw a couple people get excited on my social media, people I follow who already had their tree up before Thanksgiving. Not for me. Um, but I, one of my favorite things, and I know some people who do this as a real family tradition. I've done it a, a before in the past, but it's not like an ingrained family tradition, is lighting their Christmas tree at the same time as the Christmas tree at Rockefeller Center. So oh, lighting it up the first time. And so that's one of those things that every year I say, you know what, I should wait. But then sometimes you just can't help yourself. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's awesome. So cool. Yes. Very cool. So thanks for being on the the show, Monica. We'll see you at, uh, well, Glenn, we'll see you at Ties. I, I will be there. Yes. Uh, and I'll see you and Glenn will see you at uh, FETC in January. Thanks for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. I'm looking forward to uh, seeing you both. Thanks for listening to On Education. My name is Mike Washburn and my co-host is Glenn Irvin. Do you want to get in touch with us? check out our website at oneducationpodcast.com. You can tweet us at oneducationpod. Glenn is at Irv Spanish on Twitter. I can be found on Twitter at Mr. Washburn. Our engineers are Jake and Justin at Podcast Production Team. Check out their website at podcastproductionteam.com. You can find us on Facebook by visiting facebook.com slash oneducationpod. If you're enjoying the show and think others would too, we'd be thrilled if you shared it with them. Please leave us a rating or review in Apple Podcasts or the Google Play Store. When you leave a rating, it gives our rankings a boost, and this helps others discover the show. We want to thank our presenting sponsor, Schoology, for supporting us. Check out Schoology.com to learn how they can help you advance what's possible. Thanks as always for listening. Stay awesome. See you soon.